We've been going over biblical counseling topics. Cubby did too. I did one last week. Does anyone remember what we covered last week? We're sinners by nature. We're depraved by just default setting. Unless we intentionally go after the heart in the counseling room, here's something. We will only affect temporary change. So it's only going to be a temporary thing. It's not going to be lasting. Um, like there might be some relief. There might be some change initially, but the sinful flesh will kind of take over in the end and they'll kind of go back. A lot of times it even goes worse later. Heart change can only occur when God sends his Holy Spirit into the heart, right? We talked about that. So it's important for us to pray. Like that's actually key. If we're not praying, there's not likely going to be a lot of heart change taking place because that's all spirit led. So we need to be, the practical applications were pray for them because we know that the spirit does the work. Uh, we can live our life as an example, and we can share our faith and the gospel with them, which is the perfect segue into what we're talking about tonight, which is sharing the gospel. It's presenting the gospel to somebody. Um, who has shared the gospel or presented it to anyone? Has anyone done that? Yeah. Was it kind of scary a little bit? Was it successful? Did they become a believer? That kind of thing. What, any feedback? What do you got? Uh, I, would, I would say it was received pretty well. Good. It was pretty much needed. It's, it was needed and received well. Yeah. That's good. Has anyone shared the gospel and it did not go well? Yeah, you have? I've, you, don't have to, you don't have to say it, but that can and does happen. I, I, I mentioned last time when I was speaking that the, there was a time when I shared the gospel with somebody and it went horribly. I remember the first time very distinctly. I was actually in Perkins, which is closed down now. And I was sharing it, and it was met with hostility. But they remember here now. So that's a cool, like, it came all the way back. Like, they, they still came to Christ. So, yeah, what we're going to do, we're going to talk about sharing the gospel. But first, I got a couple verses that kind of lead us into that. Romans 10 8 through 10. We're going to be in Romans a little bit before we get into the whole thing. But we're going to start at Romans 10, 8 through 10. It says this. But what does it say? It starts that way. Uh, the word is near you, in your mouth and in your heart. That is the word of faith that we proclaim. Because if you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. For with the heart one believes and is justified, and with the mouth one confesses and is saved. So as Christians, uh, we make a profession of faith. We say, yes, we're a believer. We've, we've been saved. We put our faith in Christ. And uh, that's pretty easy to say. But then there's the second piece of that, which is the heart, which we talked about last week. So that's the second piece. That's the spirit working in us. It's, it regenerates us, gives us that new heart of flesh, and then lives and dwells within us. Yep, if we confess with our mouth and believe in our heart, we will be saved. We will be justified. There is no longer any condemnation for our, our holy, uh, before a holy and just God. And this is the good news of the gospel. So when we confess with our mouth and believe in our heart, no more condemnation. So that's the good news. That's the good news. That is, like if we were going to boil it all the way down, the gospel to like one point, that's what it is. There's no longer condemnation. He has made a way for salvation. So Romans 8, 1. There is now no longer condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. Amazing. That's good. That's the good news. From there, since we have this amazing gift and since this gift has been extended to all, God has called us to share this good news with the world around us. So Romans 10, 14 through 17 says, how then will they call on him in whom they have not believed? And how are they to believe in him of whom they have never heard? And how are they to hear without someone preaching? And how are they to preach unless they are sent? As it is written, how beautiful are the feet of those who preach the good news. So if we parked here for just a second, we can look at this. How, how then will they call on him whom they have not believed? And then the next layer They've never heard. So these people, lots of people actually, like our, our culture here in America is getting kind of 
It's, it's interesting. When I was growing up, when I was in school, like everybody had heard the gospel. We all knew what was going on. Like we, we had heard the gospel. People have gone to church. But today you can meet people who've never heard the gospel. They've never heard the good news. And it's, it's a new uh, front for us to share the gospel because they're just, they've never heard it. They don't know. And actually, if you look at culture, and I don't want to rabbit trail too much here, but if you look at the culture, you can see people are trying to find wholeness. They're trying to be made complete. And you can see even with like the transgenderism, these people are, they sense in themselves that there's something not whole, right? And they're, they have, so they, somebody has told them a different way. They said, hey, if you do this, you can be complete. You can be whole. You can be made complete and whole. And you'll find happiness and joy here. So they go, they do it. And they, they go all in with that. And there's surgeries, there's medications, et cetera, et cetera. And there's really lo- like lifelong consequences that can happen, side effects from doing that but they're doing it to be made whole because they haven't heard. They, they're, they're choosing that over Christ because we know as believers that the only time you're going to feel fulfilled or complete or whole is our, the, the, the wholeness that we feel with Christ when we're joined to Christ. So the, they're searching. Clearly they're searching. People are searching for that, but they're, they're, they're following after false prophets. They're following out after false teachings. And with devastating consequences. So here, this is where we come in with this verse. Uh, We have received the good news, and after the Holy Spirit worked in our hearts, we received the message with joy. Now, therefore, we are called to share the good news. So how can we do this? Well, we talked about a little bit last week. We do this with how we live our lives. That preaches, to, and it tells a story. It's a testimony for people around us. We could, we could do it by leading and participating in Bible studies, coming to youth group, like you guys are now, and you guys have small groups after this. Um, sharing your faith with your friends, maybe teammates, um, brothers, sisters, family, etc. cetera. And uh, in the context of biblical counseling, the, sharing the gospel should be addressed in every, every counseling case. Since we're doing a biblical counseling-focused series, We're going to talk about that, biblical counseling and presenting the gospel. We'll start off here by how do we determine if someone needs to hear the gospel, right? That's a good question. Who needs to hear it? You know, there are some people who are believers. You know, Randy, when he is preaching his sermons every Sunday, his congregation is full of people who are believers. And do they need to hear the gospel every single week, like the same gospel over and over? There can be value to doing that, but... They also, it specifically says in the word of God, and I don't have the verse and I don't have it memorized, but that, that you shouldn't just only be drinking milk, that there's a time where like when you grow up, when you mature in Christ, that you need the meat as well. So that's when you get into the deeper theology and you, and you dive deeper into the word of God. You, you no longer just gospel message only. And there are churches where every Sunday, all they do is preach the gospel only. They never get into the meat. They never get into what the Bible says about different sin issues and how, to, how we should avoid them. And it's just gospel only. And they suffer for that. But for us, in this context, how do we determine if someone needs to hear the gospel? First, we can examine the fruit of their life. And we talked about that last week, but just an extension from there. Matthew seven sixteen, you will You will recognize them by their fruits. Are grapes gathered from thorn bushes or figs from thistles? And uh, Mark 6, 43 through 45 says, For no good tree bears bad fruit, nor again does a bad tree bear good fruit. For each tree is known by its fruit. For figs are not gathered from thorn bushes, nor grapes picked from bramble bush. Uh, The good person out of the good treasure of their heart produces good, and the evil person out of the evil treasure produces evil. For out of the abundance of the heart, his mouth speaks. So if we want to know, is this person a believer? We can look at their life and see how do they respond to issues? How do they respond when, when the going gets tough? What do they do? Um, how do they speak to their parents? How do they speak to teachers? Or how do they speak to um, 
Yeah, they're friends. Are they building people up? Are they fulfilling what the word of God says? Like Ephesians 4, 29, let no unwholesome word come out of your mouth, except that which is good for the building up. Are they doing those things or are they tearing people down? Are they gossiping? So how they conduct themselves tells you what's going on in their heart. So yeah, these verses teach us that someone is known by the way they live their life. They are known for the way they speak to other people, how they respond to conflicts, their attitude towards different things. Therefore, one tool we can use to know whether someone is saved uh, is by looking at the fruit of their life. Are they producing fruit that looks like the fruit of the spirit or does it look like the fruit of the flesh? And just a word of caution here with this. It's not a perfect tool, okay? So just remember that. Uh, because somebody might be a believer, they might have backslidden, and there might be a lot of sin issues going on in their life. But, but it's a good assessment. It's like, it gives you a good hint of they're either here or they're there. Um, also, they might be a brand new Christian, just a brand new little baby Christian. There's no fruit yet, but the Spirit's living in their heart. So they're not going to have all this fruit so their life, you might look at him and be like, wow, that guy's life is total chaos. And he's in the, struggling with all these horrible sin issues. They must be an unbeliever. And it's like, well, not exactly. Like, you got to investigate a little bit more. So examining the fruit of their life, good, but not complete. You need more. Next one, ask them if they are a believer. This option is a bit more complicated because it is possible for someone to make a profession of faith without truly believing or putting their faith in Christ for salvation, right? Somebody could lie and say, yeah, I'm a believer and not really mean it. Somebody could be deceived as well and think they're a believer and say it without, without it being true. But by asking them if they are a believer, it'll off, often the answer will be black or white. It'll either be yes or no, right? Because like Genevieve said, she's heard one where it was no. I've heard one that's very distinctly no. I'm sure Keith has heard that when he's out on the street. Or uh, we've heard it. Okay, so we've heard yes and we've heard no. No is a pretty clear indicator. If they say no, they're probably not. It's probably a good indicator that they're not. But if they say yes, look at the fruit of their life. Look at what's going on. So first we're going to look at if they reject the gospel. If they say no... Why would they say no? Well, 1 Corinthians 1.18 says, For the word of the cross is folly to those who are perishing. So it's foolish to them. They don't, it's, it's dumb to them. But to us who are saved, it is the power of God. 1 Corinthians 2.14 says, The natural person does not accept the things of the Spirit of God, for they are folly. They're foolish to him. And he is not able to understand them because they're spiritually discerned. And... Romans 8, 7 through 8 says, For the mind that is set on the flesh is hostile to God, for it does not submit to God's law. Indeed, it cannot. Those who are in the flesh cannot please God. So people will reject the gospel. They'll think it's foolish. They'll think, think it's um, silly or a laughing matter. Sometimes they can even be hostile, like, like I've experienced and different people have experienced. Um, They'll get in your face with anger or become violent. And this is a pretty good indicator that they're, they're not following the Lord. They have not put their faith and trust. Uh, in fact, a lot of times that, that's an indicator that they are um, deep down. They, they know that the truth, they, they know that there's some truth to what you're saying. But they've constructed this worldview that totally rejects the gospel. And they've made decisions based on that worldview, um, maybe they've had an abortion. Maybe they've talked to somebody into having an abortion. Maybe they've um, sinfully divorced their wife, these types of things. And when you start poking at them and, and kind of questioning their worldview, and it starts shaking and starting to fall apart, they're going to get angry. Because now they're facing the reality that, yeah, I might be the villain here. I might actually be the bad guy. Because most people think of themselves as the good guy in their story, right? We're all the hero. Right? Nobody's the bad guy. But when you, when you look at everything through the biblical worldview, we can all see we're not the good guy. Right? So they don't like that, and they, they will reject it. Actually, I have found that most people do not like questioning their worldview. So just understand you, you're going out into the battle 
be prepared. Um, so that's if they're, they reject the gospel. Now let's look at if, they, if you ask them if they're a believer and they say they believe that they're saved. Okay, so this would be somebody who they believe they're saved but they're, they're not. There's, there's a deception going on there of some kind. Matthew 7, 21 through 23 says, Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but the one who does the will of my Father who is in heaven. So he's saying those will, and those will enter the kingdom of heaven. On that day, many will say to me, Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy in your name and cast out demons in your name and do my, many mighty works in your name? And then I will declare to them, I never knew you. Depart from me, you workers of lawlessness. So who do you think these people are? Who do you think in this, in this section, it's actually the uh, Sermon on the Mount that Jesus taught. Who do you think he's talking about? Does anyone have any ideas or guesses? Yeah, Christians in name only. Sure. These would be people who might... Oh, go ahead. Yeah, in that time, yeah. He was pointing out the, the religious folks of the day is what... But he was pointing out the Pharisees and those types. But today it would be, yeah, Christians in name only. People who think they're saved, they think they're uh, believers, but they don't follow the way. They don't, they don't live out their faith. The Bible has no bearing on how they conduct themselves in the world. That's who this is talking about. Um, I know when I was first believer, when you don't have a lot of fruit in your life, this was a big concern of mine. I thought, is this talking about me? Like, is this me? Um, is my faith, uh, you know, in terms of plants, uh, just a short little plant and it's got no roots. And when the first trial comes, my faith's just going to die. I was concerned about that. Very concerned, actually. Um, but I thought about this, too. I said, is this, is this me, that I'm a Christian in name only? I'm not. I say that I am and I'm deceiving myself. And then, it, and then when I actually die, I'm not going to go to heaven. So, um, by the way, if you think that way, that's probably a good sign because you're concerned about it, right? It's, so there's something working inside you like, hey, you're con you need to be concerned about this. Yeah, that's a good sign that the Spirit's working. So, um, but there are people who are deceived and um, they will profess a faith, believing they're saved, but actually not putting any hope or faith in Christ for salvation. Um, some of the people will, basically these people are following like a counterfeit gospel. Uh, they might, some might include and I'm not trying to put any other religions down, but Jehovah's Witness, Mormons, who they think they're Christians, actually. Um, some, some Catholics, I would say, too. Like, I believe that there probably are some saved Catholics, but for that, that one's a mixed bag in there. So, um, but yes, these are the false, the false gospels or the twisted or counterfeit gospels. So we got to watch out for these people, too. They'll say they're believers, but watch them. How do they live? They say they're a believer. Are they, are they living it out? So one diagnostic question. If you, if you have one takeaway from tonight, I would like it to be this. This is a, a question I know, and I know Carrie's a counselor. I know she's heard it, and I, I bet you she's even said it many times. <clears throat> it's one that Pastor Randy teaches all the counselors to say. And it reveals a lot of their theology and it reveals their understanding of salvation. And I'll read it. It says, and I would ask somebody this, I say, if while you were on your way home tonight after youth group and you got, in, uh, and you got into a horrible car accident and you lost your life and you found yourself standing before the Lord at the gates of heaven and he asked you, why should I let you into my heaven? What would you say? Right? So we're standing there because nobody, nobody plans on, and I hope this, I sincerely pray this doesn't happen, but nobody plans on dying today, right? And, uh, but it's possible. So you're standing there and he asks, why should I let you into my heaven? What are you going to say to that? Does anybody have any, does anyone want to try to answer that? You want to try? Go ahead. a good answer. You shouldn't. I don't deserve it. That's, that's a good answer. Yeah. Some common answers that, that you will hear, or especially in the counseling room, some of the common ones will be, um, I hope that my good outweighs my bad. 
right? I hope in the end that I've done more good things than I've done bad things. Well, unfortunately, the Bible teaches that the standard is perfection. So all those bad things are automatically evidence against you. Like you're not getting in, period, full stop. They're also trusting in themselves. Um, how about this one? I'm a pretty good person. I think I'm good enough. The standard is perfection, right? So you've said the good answer, uh, but I'll say what, what I would, this is like what I think a textbook answer would look like, and I'll try to get through it without getting teary. I'm, I'll do my best. Okay, <clears throat> I'd say this. I would say, like you said, that I should not be let in. I am unworthy. I have sinned against God. And I have not earned a perfect righteousness. However, I have put my faith and trust wholly into Christ for salvation. Rather than trusting in myself and my works, my trust is fully in Christ in the sacrifice he made on the cross in which he took upon himself the condemnation that was meant for me. And, uh, and my trust is in the righteousness that he earned by living the perfect life, fulfilling the law of God perfectly. And the scriptures teach me that if I believe in him, put my trust in him, that he will clothe me with that righteousness as a gift and I will be adopted into the family. So if I am to enter, it is only by God's grace, love, and mercy. So I'm not trusting in myself, fully trusting in, in the Lord. That would be a... I don't know, Carrie could critique it. Good answer, good, decent answer. That's good because it's not putting, the whole point is don't put your trust in yourself. Put your trust in what Christ did on the cross and what he did in, this, in his life by fulfilling the, the law perfectly, earning righteousness. Uh, one thing before we go to the, to the actual core of this, which is going to be presenting the gospel, um, I want to talk about motives for a second. This is really short, actually. But when we, when we go to present the gospel with somebody, we should, be, we should have a sincere desire to save that person's soul, to help them. Like we, we have, for better or worse, stumbled upon this truth in our lives or we, somebody shared the gospel with us and we, and praise God, God did a work in our heart and caused us to believe and we're, we're believers and, and we, have, we have this treasure now. We have this amazing gift and people are suffering in the world. The, the world right around us, maybe even in your own households, people are suffering. And, and we have this amazing gift. So it starts with a, a sincere desire to help them. Um, the attitudes we should have about this is gentleness. Talks about that in Galatians 6, 1 through 2. Brothers, you who are spiritual in a spirit of gentleness... Uh, we should, um, the other one would be like Ephesians 4.15, I believe, which talks about speaking the truth in love. So it should be rooted in love. We should be, it shouldn't be a, I know something you don't. It should, there should be no levels of pride in it. Um, and, and because we know that like some of those verses I talked about, the natural default setting is going to be to look at it as foolishness and to reject it. We should not be surprised if that's the result, that they reject it or they can't accept it. What that tells you is, got to pray for them. But like really pray for them because we need the Spirit to do a work in their heart. Like, like write it down or however you do it. Just remember, maybe anytime it comes to your mind, any, anytime somebody comes to your mind, just pray for them. And keep praying for them. And keep praying for them. And seek opportunities to share the gospel with them, sure. But be praying for them. I think I beat that one to death. So let's look at it. So the gospel presentation. Has anyone actually gone through the gospel presentation, the Stuart Scott edition? Yeah, some few. Um, I'm not going to go through the whole thing. In fact, I'm going to do this pretty brief. Like we're going to blast through it really fast, exceptionally fast. And some of the headings that I'm going to go over aren't exactly word for word the headings in there. What I'm trying to do tonight is give you the gist. I want you to have the core, truly the core elements. So I'm going to give you a, a heading and a goal. We can talk about it a little bit. Heading, goal, heading, goal. And we'll go with that. And then we'll just close out. And then you guys can go to your small groups and talk about it. So it might be shorter than I think. I don't know how long it's going to go. We'll see. So the overview, 
here are the core elements that I have found. And I actually met with Pastor Randy this past week and I sat him down because the gospel presentation is, I've, I've known that it's a valuable tool, but I didn't fully understand how to use it. And, and he has them broken down into sections, but uh, or it is broken down into sections, but I didn't understand what is important in each section. Like before I move to the next one, I need to know what I'm supposed to be teaching. So we're going to go through each one of these one at a time. So if you're writing them, I'm about to click, but I have them rewritten on every slide. So we should be good right there. There you go. So the first one is the character of God, majesty, holiness, and justice. So this is where we'd want to start. We're going to talk about God to start. Our goal in this section is to emphasize the majesty and holiness of God. Uh, he is pure light and no darkness is in him at all. He is set apart. It's also to emphasize his perfect justice. So the majesty, holiness, justice. He will not overlook any iniquity or sin and nothing will be hidden from him. Therefore, if anyone has something to hide, they should be consumed by terror. Like, you should be afraid, actually. Because if you have something to hide, and we know that his justice is perfect. Think about a judge, right, in a courtroom. So they're sitting there on their, I don't know, I don't want to call it a throne, but it seems like it's a throne. It's a high-up chair with the gavel and everything. He's got the black robe. And uh, let's say I was, I'm there because I was speeding. And let's say I was guilty, actually. I was caught, red-handed. They knew it. I was speeding. It was a criminal offense. Let's say I was going double the speed limit. I was going 150. That's crazy. Like, you should be arrested for that. Full disclosure, high schoolers, don't do it. Get a job as a cop or a paramedic or something like that. Then you can drive fast and it's legal. But don't do it until you can do it legally, okay? Or a race car driver. Anyway, so I'm standing there before the judge, and I'm guilty, and he asks... Uh, did you do this? And I'm like, yep, I did it. And he's like, you know what? Because you were truthful, I'm going to I'm gonna let you off on this. And he's like, I'm, I, we're just going to let you off. We're just going to take it all off. Hits the gavel, not guilty. That was a benefit to me, right? Huge benefit to me. But was his justice perfect? It wasn't perfect. Because I was wrong. I did commit the crime. And if he was going to have perfect justice every crime would be guilty. Everyone, no matter what. And his justice, God's justice is perfect. Every single time, no matter what, there's nothing that will be hidden on the day of judgment. Everything will be revealed. So therefore, if somebody has something to hide, they should be, there should be a fear. So when we're going through the first section, our goal is to establish a reverence for the Lord. I think I have it there. Yes. Reverence. So I looked up the definition because I don't know how many of you are going around using reverence every day. Maybe some. I don't. Reverence means profound respect and esteem mingled with fear and affection as for a holy be being or place, holy place. So it's a respect. It's an esteem. They uh, uh, like looking up to it. And it's mingled with fear. So if you think of the Lord, if his justice is perfect, there's going to be fear there. But he's all, there's also like a respect because he is holy. He is set apart. He is perfect. His justice is perfect. So reverence, having a reverent view of God is very appropriate. That's the right view. So reverence, that is our goal here. I don't know if I have anything after this for that. And if there's anything you want to add, counselor, well, if there is, when we're going through, just let me know. But yeah, I do have some verses and stuff, but I, actually what I did do is I printed off the gospel presentations. I have enough for everyone for the small groups. And then I do have the questions kind of working you through there, but we'll just go through each point. So the second part we look at is the character and nature of mankind. And that is as originally created. And why is that important? Well, in this section, our goal is to emphasize that mankind was created by God to live harmoniously with God in intimate fellowship. This relationship was intended to evoke joy, peace, closeness, 
safety, and security. So we are made in his image, right? In the Garden of Eden, there was no sin. You need to think, if you look back, you can read about Adam and Eve walking with him in the, in the garden, walking with God, and, and there was no sin, and they, they weren't afraid. It was peaceful. There was safety. It was secure. Um, that's what it was originally. And also, when we were made, when man was made in his image, everything we did brought glory to him, which is pretty cool. As believers, when we fulfill the law of God in our actions, when we make the word become flesh in us, we are actually bringing glory to God in the same way. So that's pretty cool. Um, so that's what we're trying to do. We're trying to point out, I'll go back to that for just for a second. Yep, emphasize that mankind was, the focus here is like the intimate fellowship, the harmony, the joy, the peace, the closeness. Next one, the nature of sin. So the goal, sin originated in heaven, which is interesting, right? When Satan sought to be God himself, right? He rebelled and he wanted to be God. So he was actually, it says that there was a battle and Satan was thrown out of heaven with a third of the angels, or it says in Revelation, a third of the stars came with him. Uh, and that God actually created hell for Satan and the demons, the fallen angels. Um, okay, so that's interesting. Sin, it makes sense, though, because then when man was walking through the garden or when Eve stumbled upon the serpent, right, he had already fallen, right? He had already fallen because he was trying to deceive Eve. Man sinned against God with the same sin, actually, desiring to be our own God, because the, ser the serpent said, uh, you will not surely die. You will be like God. And then she went on from there, but then she saw the fruit, saw that it was good to eat, and then it made us like God. <coughs> Ate the apple. That sin is still plaguing us today. In our society, in our culture, it's a plague. So that was it, to desire to be our own God. Uh, it was an act of mutiny and rebellion. Our goal is in this section is to define and illustrate what sin is and how it functions. Sin by nature separates. I know a lot of you have heard this, but when you're sharing the gospel, they won't. They won't have heard this. So remember that. Like they don't, they're not going to know these things. It divides husbands and wives. It divides parents from children or children from parents. It divides brothers and sisters. It divides uh, friends, you know, when friends have falling out, etc. coworkers. So anytime there is division, you can be certain that sin is present. So that's really what we're trying to emphasize here. And especially in the context of biblical counseling, because they're probably in biblical counseling because things are not going well. Maybe there's some sin issues going on. Maybe there's some separation, especially in a, married, a marriage situation. You'll see that. The, mar the married couple are, they'll come in and they're, you know, the husband's like this and the, the wife's like this on the other side. And like they're, they're not only separated in the sense that they aren't ha share, they're not in like, they're not having an intimate relationship, like a close relationship, but they're physically separated, like leaning on their chair away. It's, it's pretty obvious. You'll see it. If you know what to look for, you can see it. Some people are good at hiding it. So that's what we're trying to teach. That's the point of teaching the sin. And then man's hopelessness. So the goal here is to illustrate mankind's objective stance before a holy, perfect, and just God. No person will be found righteous or justified on their own merit or works, nor can it be earned by works. You can't earn the salvation nor this, the righteousness. Man cannot be justified by being uh, born into a Christian family, for example, let's say both your parents are Christian and they are making you go to a youth group and you're like, I don't know about this Christianity stuff. Uh, well, they're, the fact that they're believers won't, won't get you in. Like you have to have your own salvation. You have to have your own faith. Uh, our sin debt is hopelessly beyond what we could ever imagine to atone for on our own or pay on our own. We can't pay for it on our own. So that's the next section, talking about man's hopelessness. Then when we get to this point, so we've talked about the character of God. We started with that, you know, uh, that he is 
um, perfect, that his judgments are perfect. Then we talked about man. Man was made in his image. We were we had closeness with God. We had a good relationship with him. Sin came into the world and it separated everything. And now our sin debt is so high that we, we have no hope. Okay. So at this point, this is what Pastor Randy actually suggested. We do a summary and we summarize the first four sections. This summary is meant to emphasize the severity and seriousness. Come back screen uh, seriousness of the situation if if that something doesn't change they can only look forward to damnation for eternity so before we move on like i just recapped you'll want to recap so when you're sharing this you'd want to recap it and say hey you know god is perfect and holy his justice is always perfect man was created by god in his image to enjoy an intimate close relationship with him glorifying God in all that we do. Sin originated in heaven and spread to mankind. It separated us from this harmonious and intimate relationship with God. And it separates us from each other. And due to that sin nature, all have separated ourselves from God and are apart from him. And we are in utter hopelessness, destined to hell for eternity because of sinfulness. So it seems heavy, but that's the point. The point is to emphasize their actual seriousness, the seriousness of their situation. Like, it's a big deal. Then we transition. So it's about, there's four parts and there's another four parts. Now we transition to the character of God, part two, right? Because we only looked at, like, his perfection and, and his majesty and all that. Now we're going to look at his love, grace, and mercy, so the goal here is to develop a more complete view of God, not just focusing on the justice and perfection, but now emphasizing love, grace, and mercy. After confronting our hopeless situation, this section is meant to usher in peace and hope that God's love for us is so awesome in the true sense of the word awesome, like putting us in awe, right? Uh, that it's difficult for us to even understand or comprehend. So there is an emphasis here also on grace. I wonder if I have that in here. Yeah, there is an emphasis on grace, discussing the difference between common grace and saving grace. That's a really important point. Um, I know Randy will typically use an illustration of having two farmers on either side of the road, and one's a believer and one's not but the rains come and it falls on both crops, right? The, the, the person who's not a believer, he gets rain on his crops. The person who is a believer gets rain on his crops. That's common grace. The fact that we're not struck dead instantly when we, when we sin, common grace, that kind of stuff. Saving grace is a little different, right? That's where, where he comes into our lives. He intervenes and he, he, he saves us. So it's a big difference there. But the common grace reigns on the sinners and the not. Um, I'll let you small group leaders go from there. Um, so continuing on, if God did all the work for your salvation, sending his son. Oh, yeah, he wanted me to emphasize this. I should have put this in quotes. So again, when I was talking to Randy, he talked about this. And he said in this section, he really emphasizes this. He's, and he'll say this to the person. He says, if God did all the work for your salvation, sending his son, Jesus Christ, to the earth to live the perfect life, earning a perfect righteousness, which is necessary to earn salvation, and dying the sinner's death on the cross, paying the penalty for all your sins, but left only one thing. So he invites you that if you would just choose to follow Christ apart from the Holy Spirit, drawing you to him that nobody would be saved so if he did all the work except that you just had to accept it nobody would be saved because if we look back to first corinthians 1 18 and 2 14 it says the message of the cross is foolishness right the word of god is foolishness to these people to people who are unsaved i have a bunch of verses we'll just skip through that you guys can check them out later. 
From that part, we move to Christ's righteousness and sacrifice. So the goal in this section, I know I'm going fast, guys, and I know it's a lot, but we're almost done. Two, three more sections here. So Christ's righteousness and sacrifice. Christ is fully God, fully man. He was the embodiment of the word of God becoming flesh, like it talks about in John 1, 14. Meaning that he fully lived out the word of God perfectly. His sacrificial death on the cross paid in full the penalty for our sins, satisfying God's righteous wrath against us sinners. Christ's earned righteousness is now imputed unto believers or, give, or it's accounted to them fully as if they had done the work themselves. So he paid the penalty for the sins, but that just leaves you neutral, right? Because you didn't earn any righteousness. So if, you, if all of our sins are forgiven... We're neutral, so we're still not getting in. We also need the righteousness of Christ imputed to us or given to us as if we are, uh, as if we had done the, the works ourselves. Although we didn't, Christ did. So that's the next section, talking about Christ. Then we move on to a true saving faith. The goal here is that man can have a knowledge about God you know, we think about that verse where even the demons believe and they shudder, right? They have a knowledge of it, that he exists, but uh, they, uh, okay, so man can have a knowledge, but they can fail to put their hope and faith in Christ fully for salvation. So a true saving faith exists when someone puts their total reliance on Jesus Christ for their salvation. They trust both in his earned righteousness and the sacrifice he made on the cross. So true saving faith. They put their hope and faith in them. I know there's a, a short little, um, and it's not a hymn, but it's like a little saying where it says, nothing to the cross I bring, holy to the cross I cling. So I bring nothing to my salvation and I fully trust in what happened on the cross. And the last one here, and this is kind of where it ends. And this is actually the jump off point, typically for in Randy's case, how he uses it. But this is typically a jump off point in the counseling process where he goes through a list of the wrong ways to come to the Lord. And the goal in this section is to review a variety of different ways that people can turn to the Lord for salvation. So the wrong ways to do it. This is meant for their self-reflection. So as you go through this section, reading each verse and explaining and discussing why each way is wrong, the individual has an opportunity to consider their own motives here. Okay, this is often the point that will jump into the counseling process and transition away uh, with such a heavy, heavy emphasis on the gospel. So we'll shift away from that towards the, the, the counseling process. And uh, in the gospel presentation, he has a list of them. I don't have it listed in front of me, but there's a list of, of, of reasons why it would be wrong. One would be that I'm good already. And if I follow the Lord, I can be a little bit better. Wrong, wrong thinking. Or I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to put my faith in Christ for what I can get out of it. And that's, I would say, a, I'd say there's probably a lot of people who have done that. Like, I, I can get this out of it, so I'm going to do it. And that's, that's the wrong reason, too. So, um, yeah, that's the, whole, that's the whole process. So, I went from the start all the way to the finish, and this is where you would jump off. You know, when you're going through that list, if somebody's like, you know what, I relate to that, then you would kind of hop off after, because you know you gathered the data, you did all those things. That was like week two, I think, when Covey was teaching, the second week of this. Um, you've gathered the data. You know where their issues are. You have a good idea of where their sin issues are. So you can kind of emphasize that when you're going through anyway. Again, spirit of gentleness, sincere love, not to condemn and be mean to them, but for their good. And then you jump off, and that's where you go, right into the counseling process. But I'll let Cubby teach about that, because then he'll get into the progressive sanctification and all that. So, yeah, you guys have heard it all now. I don't have, oh, I do have a quick summary, I guess. This isn't in my notes, so I'll have to read it on the screen. So, summary. Sharing the gospel is the responsibility of all believers, right? Not just counselors, not just pastors. Anyone who's a believer can do it. Some people are more skilled at it than others, but if you're fine, like if you think, oh, I'm not really skilled to do that, 
then get skilled to do it. Like practice, practice doing it. Uh, study the word of God. That'll be a good, good way to build up that skill. We should, when we're going to share the gospel, determine if somebody needs to hear the gospel by examining the fruit of their life. What does it look like? By asking them if they're a believer, right? Uh, and then you can also ask that diagnostic question. It'll be, it'll reveal a lot of what they think. Are they going to earn their salvation? Is their good going to outweigh their bad? It tells you what they think of God. How, how perfect is his justice? You know, that kind of stuff was revealed in that answer. And then three, understanding the core elements of the gospel and the gospel presentation helps us be more effective when sharing the gospel. So if we read through it, if you guys work your way through it, a couple times maybe, if you have time, but just be thinking about like what, how does this all weave together? Because there is a line when you go through that gospel presentation, there's a line going through there. There's a purpose. It can seem just like a Bible study of theology, 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 but there's, there's a purpose going through it. So the summary that I just gave you, not this one, but when I summarize those eight points, that's the line. So be thinking about that when you're going through it. And that's all I got. Heavenly Father, I just, again, want to thank you for uh, planting this church here, for the bringing this youth group together and causing it to grow. Uh, it's, it's amazing to see so many high schoolers here willing to learn about your word and study um, what, what your word has to say for them and for their life. Uh, I pray that as they go out into the, the world that you would prepare them to share the gospel and uh, to, to just have a good understanding of what the gospel is and what it means for the unsaved. And that when, they, when it's received with joy, that they can share in that joy. And when it's received with hostility and anger, that they'll understand what needs to be done next. And that is to pray for that person's heart, to pray that there would be heart change. Because we know, God, that unless you do the work, unless you send your spirit, Somebody who resists the gospel will not be saved. So um, having that understanding is just amazing. I pray that as, uh, as we go out into the world and share the gospel, I pray that you would use this church and these high schoolers mightily to spread the gospel in this community and even further. Uh, I pray that you'd make them effective instruments in your hands uh, for your glory and for your good. And uh, I pray that you'd watch over them the rest of the week. In your name we pray, amen.